Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michael Collins, and I'm the Director General of the uh, Institute of International and European Affairs. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all uh, to this latest IIEA webinar. And we're absolutely delighted this afternoon to be joined by Tony Connolly, uh, RTE Europe Editor, who has been generous enough to take time out of his schedule uh, to speak to us, uh, to talk to us on the subject matter of Brexit. Uh, Tony will speak to us for about uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we will go to our usual Q&A uh, with you, our participants, and you'll be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, uh, which you should see on your screen. Uh, please feel free to send your questions throughout the session, or indeed when Tony has finished speaking, uh, and we will come to them then in the, uh, the Q&A part of our um, event. A reminder that today's presentation is on the record, while the Q&A is off the record under Chatham House rule. And please feel free to join the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Tony Connolly is well known to all of us, I think. He's an award-winning journalist and author. As Europe editor uh, for RT News, he has been covering Euro European, EU, uh, and European affairs uh, from Brussels now for almost 20 years, uh, since 2001. And he's reported extensively on the period before, during and after the Brexit referendum. And uh, before that covered the European refugee crisis, the Greek debt crisis, the Irish bailout and financial crisis dating back to 2008. 2008. So he's a man pretty familiar with the whole world of crisis. Uh, Tony was awarded the Outstanding Achievement Award for Journalism at the UCD Smurfit Business School for his coverage of key events in Europe in 2018. And he's written um, for numerous uh, national and international uh, uh, publications and news agencies. And his most recent book, uh, Brexit in Ireland, The Dangers, the Opportunities and the Inside Story of the Irish Response was published in October 2017. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Tony um, and I look forward to his presentation. And just again, to extend a very warm welcome back to him to the IIEA. So Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Michael, and good afternoon, everybody. So we are at a very intriguing moment in the Brexit negotiations. We've had a very strange period of six months when Brexit formally happened at the end of January, 31st of January. Both sides drew up their negotiating mandates in February, and then the negotiations got underway proper at the beginning of March. But then the global pandemic struck, uh, and that has had a huge impact on the logistics of having the negotiations and uh, also on the politics of whether or not the UK should seek an extension to the transition period to accommodate the disruption that the pandemic has caused. In the event, we've had uh, four rounds of negotiations. One of them was face-to-face -face at the beginning of March, but then the others have been uh, virtual meetings uh, of the negotiating teams by video conference and of course that has uh, had its own problems and limitations uh, just in terms of the technology and uh, the logistics around that but more importantly it took away the very valuable face-to-face -face nuanced part of the negotiation process uh, and diplomacy uh, where people can start to scope out the room for manoeuvre uh, when they talk in corridors or have a coffee uh, or do that uh, informal side of the process, uh, sometimes the non-verbal side of the process, but all of that was not possible during the pandemic. So unsurprisingly, the final round of the first half of the negotiations concluded with no uh, real breakthrough on any of the major issues uh, and there was indeed uh, a fairly downbeat um, a assessment of where things were at by both uh, chief negotiators, probably more on the EU side uh, with Michel Barnier complaining in particular that the UK was retreating from the letter and the spirit of the political declaration, which of course accompanied the withdrawal agreement and sets out the um, the vision of where the future relationship should should end up. Um, after the break of the, after the final round finished, there was of course a high level meeting between Boris Johnson and the three leaders of the main institutions. So Ursula von der Leyen of the Commission, Charles Michel of the Council and David Sassoli of the European Parliament. 
Uh, interestingly, that high-level format was uh, dreamed up by one Theresa May. Uh, we all remember her uh, because she was worried that after Brexit and after the UK left uh, the EU formally, there wouldn't be a forum or a platform for uh, a UK prime minister to meet uh, the senior principles of the European institutions. So um, that meeting took place Monday week ago, and it was really quite a sober uh, event. Again, it was done virtually. And it was, it was really a stock-taking exercise with both sides acknowledging that there hadn't been any real breakthrough uh, and that things were not looking good. Um, but I, I would uh, qualify that fairly quickly by saying that, uh, and to a surprising degree in my view, there was a degree of optimism uh, on the EU side, which I was not personally expecting. And that was because... Both sides recommitted strongly to getting a deal this year. Uh, so it's clearly in, in the interests of both sides to get an agreement. Boris Johnson recommitted himself to the political declaration, although again he said it's, it's not legally binding, it's only a framework. And the EU side said that while they believe that their mandate uh, that they've given Michel Barnier uh, shouldn't change at this point, that both sides would have to compromise, and including the EU side. Um, and, and that was seen as, uh, certainly by me and by other observers of this process, that things were not perhaps quite as bad as they had seemed. Another thing worth pointing out is that in the UK's negotiating mandate, they said that if things were not going uh, well by June, the UK would walk away from the process and start preparing for uh, an outcome which would mean no trade deal by the end of the year. Now, that clearly hasn't happened. So again, that's given some people signs of encouragement. Um, in the run-up to the high-level conference uh, and af after the failure of the initial rounds, the UK were pushing for uh, an accelerated negotiating process and possibly even uh, a tunnel. Uh, now, for those of you who aren't familiar with this terminology, the tunnel is where both sides get into a very intensive, uh, highly hermetically sealed environment where they can thrash out an agreement without necessarily having to brief their own constituencies every day or every other day and without any media leaks uh, in the process, which uh, would lend the process a, a sense of um, success or, or give, give it a better chance uh, of success. Now, th this happened, of course, in the withdrawal agreement last October, but uh, it's felt here in Brussels that that was somewhat detri detrimental to the UK side, certainly more so than to the EU side. In the event, there was a tunnel, an agreement was done by the end of October, but Boris Johnson had to accept a, situ a solution to the Irish question, which was quite similar to that presented by the European Commission in February of 2018, uh, which was you know, widely and robustly rejected by Theresa May and, and everybody else in the British establishment. So I think Boris Johnson paid a price for uh, the, the, the tunnel action of last year. And so in recent weeks, you've heard British sources and politicians like Penny Mordaunt of the Cabinet Office saying that we should get uh, into a much more intense phase of negotiations in July so that the UK would not be stuck then uh, in another tunnel situation at the last minute. Because if you're in a tunnel it's uh, and, and the clock is ticking, it's very hard to have a wholesale rewriting of a legal text. So you tend to have to go for something that's off the shelf. And that would tend to favor the EU side in these negotiations. So the feeling in Brussels was that there was no way that we would get into a tunnel uh, at that point uh, in July. Uh, mainly because the German presidency is taking over on the 1st of July and the German presidency uh, wants to exclusively concentrate on the uh, multi-annual financial framework, in other words, the seven-year EU budget, and of course, the uh, coronavirus recovery fund. So that's going to take up all of the uh, EU's energies and attention in July. Uh, and then after the break in August, that's the time when things would uh, get into that intense uh, high gear uh, moment of, of a tunnel, September, October. 
And also there was a feeling uh, on the EU side that the UK would have to move on some of its red lines before they would get into a tunnel. And in the first part of the negotiations, uh, there didn't seem to be any real evidence that that was uh, the case, certainly from, uh, from the EU side. Um, but both sides did, uh, even though there was no tunnel set up, both sides did agree to uh, uh, a different kind of intensif intensification of uh, the negotiations. And that intensification will start on Monday. So this is a good time to be looking ahead to that. Um, and, and what they've done is, of course, first thing to note is that this is going to be a, these are going to be a face-to-face -face, uh, meetings. It's not going to be virtual anymore. And they've reduced the numbers of negotiators to smaller groups um, in the hope that they can work uh, more productively. Because during the lockdown, we had uh, a situation where there, were, there was 100 negotiators on one side and 100 uh, on the other so they've broken it down to smaller groups, and on Monday, uh, a little fewer than two dozen British officials will come over to Brussels. They'll go into the Berlin Mall. There'll probably be uh, a certain protocol in terms of sanit sanitation and sanitization. Um, uh, but they will get together, and they're trying to create a, a process whereby the two principals, Michel Barnier on the EU side and David Frost on the UK side, can have a much more direct input uh, into this, into these technical negotiations between smaller teams of negotiators. And the reason for that is they're trying to scope out what are the margins for maneuver uh, on each other's positions. And if Barnier and Frost are uh, looking over their shoulders, the shoulders at that point, it gives the process a bit of political cover uh, and it means that both sides can move more quickly if they believe that polit political cover uh, is there. So the feeling here in Brussels is that next week will be critical. Um, it's kind of a pilot week, if you like. They're, they're trying this new process out. And if by the end of the week there's a good atmosphere and that, you know, without both sides necessarily caving on their red lines, if there is sign a sign that both sides are able to start to look at those margins for maneuver um, and the atmosphere is good, then that will determine how the other four weeks of this uh, new process uh, will unfold. Um, but of course, the corollary of that is that if things are not looking good by the end of this week and both sides are kind of sticking to their uh, rhetorical red lines, then that, that doesn't look uh, good at all uh, for the process. So what are the main sticking points? Well, of course, they've been boiled down to uh, four key problem areas. Uh, one is, of course, the level playing field, and that includes state aid. The second one is fisheries, a very important subject for Ireland. The third is police and judicial cooperation uh, and criminal justice. And the fourth is governance. In other words, how do you solve disputes in the future between both sides? What role will international arbitration have? What will the dispute resolution mechanisms look like? What uh, role will the European Court of Justice have? Uh, and these are the four areas that have proved simply uh, unsolvable in the first part of the negotiations. Um, to put it simply, of course, the UK believes that the EU is asking it to bind itself to EU regulations in perpetuity, that the EU is asking it to sign up to obligations that the EU didn't impose on uh, countries like Japan, South Korea, and Canada in recent free trade agreements, uh, and that especially on state aid where the EU's negotiating mandate spells out that the UK would have to follow EU rules, be subject to the European Court of Justice when it comes to state aid, uh, and the UK is saying this is simply an affront to their newfound uh, sovereignty and, and to democracy itself. Um, the EU's uh, I suppose, understanding of the level playing field is that, of course, and we've heard this said many times, the UK is not like uh, Japan or Canada or South Korea in terms of its size, in terms of its geographical proximity to the EU. Uh, so therefore, uh, there has to be a much more robust uh, level playing field agreement between both sides. Uh, now, what does level playing field mean? Uh, in simple terms, the EU doesn't want the UK to be undercutting European uh, companies by uh, deregulating industries uh, with a, a kind of a race to the bottom. Uh, 
the political declaration commits both sides to uh, to staying at the level of um, the, the, the same standards when it comes to labor law, when it comes to social protection, when it comes to the environment, climate change and taxation. In other words, at the end of the transition, the UK would promise not to lower its standards from the position that it's in. And of course, the position that it's in at the end of the transition will be that which has been determined by EU law. Uh, and the EU even would, would like a situation where both sides can every couple of years agree to increase its sta increase their standards, raise their standards uh, accordingly. Um, but of course, the UK believes that uh, it shouldn't have to follow EU standards or rules, that its own standards and rules will be absolutely fine um, uh, and there shouldn't be a problem. Uh, now, that, those are one set of issues uh, that the EU is very concerned about. Um, they don't want to be undercut by uh, British companies. Um, however, the issue regarding state aid is, is a much more fundamental one, and this is uh, probably going to be the hardest nut to crack. Um, promising that you don't lower your standards below a th certain threshold when it comes to labor law, when it comes to social rights and so on, is one thing. But committing to a regime where you promise as a government, as a state, not to step in and intervene in the economy to the benefit of one sector or one particular company that would give you uh, a competitive edge over the EU or vice versa, that's a much more tricky thing because it does encroach into uh, the sense of sovereignty, the sense that the state can do what it likes um, when it comes to managing its own economy. And of course, in the pandemic, governments across the world, and in particular in the EU, have been stepping in right, left, and center to intervene, to bail out sectors, to bail out companies uh, that were threatened by the pandemic. Uh, and so you could say that, well, how can both sides sign up to something when something like this happens when a pandemic comes along? Uh, but that, ironically, is the very reason why the EU wants to have something that is understood uh, by both sides, so that when there is a shock that comes along, uh, even if it's an asymmetric shock, at least both sides will know what are the principles that they've both signed up to, and how have those principles been codified in a treaty. Um, so to explain the EU's position on state aid, they want something that is long-lasting, that uh, is clear and understandable by both sides that will be driven by a set of principles that the both, both sides sign up to and as I said will be translated into a set of rules that, that kind of work that people know uh, exactly how they will work. Um, the UK's preference is to, to go for the World Trade Organization uh, mechanisms which they say are robust enough to protect against uh, any rigging of the system by a government, by the UK government stepping in to bail out uh, certain companies or sectors. The UK is very fond of reminding everybody that they are one of the uh, least offending member states when it comes to state aid infringement proceedings. Uh, Germany and uh, France are much more egregious in their flouting of state aid rules. So therefore, why should the UK not be trusted to uh, be reasonable and to follow a, a certain uh, pathway when it comes to, to state aid. Um, but the, the EU doesn't buy that for the moment. Uh, and in recent days, we've had some signals from London, uh, which have been somewhat um, contradicted by David Frost in a, a Twitter feed yesterday. Uh, this idea that both sides would sign up to an understanding on state aid and level playing field, but if the UK felt the need to diverge uh, from that particular pathway, then they would take the pain in terms of uh, tariffs that the EU would uh, impose on, on a particular sector that the UK has been uh, bailing out. Um, now, when you talk to officials here in Brussels about this particular idea, uh, we quickly get into this notion of, of a marriage. Uh, so the UK is almost saying, uh, well, yes, I'll marry you, but I want the uh, possibility 
ability to sleep around from time to time. And if I do sleep around and get caught, then I don't mind if you put me on the couch for a few days or if you kick me out and, and throw my guitar out the window. Um, that's fine by me. Um, so it's almost like they're pricing in uh, what that divergence uh, would, would allow them, uh, that they could diverge where it suits them and then pay the penalty by way of tariffs. And the EU's approach to this is entirely different. They want something, as I say, that is um, long lasting, that doesn't end up with a dispute resolution uh, problem every six months, um, that doesn't get into an escalating tariff war. And privately officials here think that the, the UK understands that and that the UK probably doesn't want that either, um, which may explain why Yesterday, David Frost, in his Twitter feed, denied that the UK wanted to have a uh, a license to diverge and uh, then to pay the price through uh, tariffs that would apply to particular goods or a particular sector. Um, on fisheries, briefly, um, yeah, again, the European Commission has been following the mandate laid down by member states on fisheries. In fact, when the Commission drew up its draft mandate, fisheries was one area where member states sent the mandate back and said, no, they want it tougher than what the Commission had uh, proposed originally. So uh, on fisheries, the EU wants pretty much the existing quota system to, to remain, the, the status quo to, to, to continue uh, as, it, as it has operated uh, in the common fisheries policy. So effectively, the argument is that for decades, perhaps centuries, European fleets have had access to UK waters and they've enjoyed the ability to catch a certain quota of, of uh, various species. Uh, and this again was codified in the common fisheries policy uh, and the EU is saying, well, we want that to continue because those are historic rights that we've had. The UK position is, no, we're taking back control of our territorial waters. We're going to be an independent coastal state. So therefore we're the ones who are going to not control all the quotas in our waters that they don't have the capacity to catch all those fish but that they would uh, be in the driving seat uh, and to uh, have discretion over who comes in how much quota they get now the approach the uk is taking is instead of relative stability which is the mechanism which reflects these historical quota uh, share outs they want something called zonal attachment a very technical term, I won't get into the details, but essentially it's using deep data to identify where exactly the fish are, where they breed, where they spawn, where they migrate. Uh, and uh, to cut a long story short, that would give the UK more quota than it gets at the moment. The UK also wants an annual negotiation with the EU um, on the share out of quotas. Um, and uh, the EU is saying, absolutely not, uh, that's never gonna work. Um, Britain says, well, you have an annual negotiation with Norway. The EU says, well, we share seven species with Norway. We share over 100 species with the UK. So technically impossible to do an annual quota negotiation for 100 species. Um, so again, so that's the kind of deadlock there. The UK believes it is being reasonable, um, accepting some quota for European fleets, but not the status quo. Um, Michel Barnier signaled on a few occasions that perhaps zonal attachment was one criteria they could look at, but they'd also have to look at the historical uh, criteria as well. Um, I think there was an element there of both sides inching out of their shells a little bit, but then their constituencies cried foul. Uh, and Michel Barnier then had a uh, apparently fairly difficult meeting with the group of eight fishing countries of which Ireland is a member who told him, no, you've got to stick to your mandate. This is not the time to be, um, to be compromising on our red lines on fisheries. Uh, so again, this is another issue that's going to have to come under this new procedure uh, next week. Uh, another problem, again, of course, is police and judicial cooperation. Uh, I'll be short here. This is a very important area for the EU because if the UK wants to have continued access to crime and pr prosecution databases uh, uh, that the EU have. There's a, there's a cluster of different databases um, that relate to fingerprints, DNA, uh, license plates, criminal records. 
these fall under different mechanisms like the Prum uh, decision and so on, the Schengen information system and so on. Um, the EU is going to insist that if the UK wants access to some of those mechanisms, they're going to have to uh, allow European Court of Justice oversight. Uh, they're going to have to at least uh, uh, make sure that the European Court of Human Rights is abided by in every decision and, and every mechanism that is set up. Um, and this is, again, is, is causing uh, troubles. Um, finally, on governance, the fourth of the big outstanding areas, the UK wants a straightforward free trade agreement, uh, a comprehensive free trade agreement with uh, zero tariff and zero quotas. Um, and then they want a sequence of other freestanding uh, agreements on aviation, for example, on fisheries, uh, on other uh, aspects of cooperation. And they want those to have their own uh, governance uh, regimes or, or umbrellas. Um, the EU, on the other hand, wants one overarching agreement with one clear governance system uh, that uh, is clear to everyone and that works. And again, you're getting into this kind of fundamental difference of aspiration, if you like. The EU wants something that is going to be long-lasting, clear, uh, bound into a treaty that is everybody knows where they stand and does not lead to endless disputes between both sides. Um, the UK wants something a lot, a lot looser, no role whatsoever for the European Court of Justice uh, and different governance mechanisms for different uh, standalone agreements that, that they're keen on. Um, so, so those are the big outstanding issues. A brief word on the Northern Ireland Protocol, which I'm sure we'll get into in the Q&A. Of course, the UK uh, must implement the protocol or else there will be no uh, free trade agreement. The two things are uh, very clearly linked by the EU and it's written into the political declaration and indeed the withdrawal agreement. Um, and I'm happy to go into more detail on the Northern Ireland Protocol uh, over the, the Q&A. But that's a sense really of the new, um, the new negotiating session we are, or, or uh, segment that we're getting into now from next week and a sense of what the key outstanding issues are. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Tony, that, for that comprehensive and uh, timely insight as well. I uh, really appreciate it, and we've lots of questions coming in. But maybe just start with one. Um, in fact, it's one that I wanted to talk about myself, really, uh, as well, by way of an introductory question, and that's the question of trust. Um, I suppose for these negotiations, and for most negotiations, any negotiations to work, uh, there has to be a degree of trust between the two sides. And uh, this is a question also echoed by, echoed by John O'Hagan uh, from Trinity College in Dublin, who asks, can the current British government be trusted to honour fully existing agreements, um, to, to honour fully existing agreements and hence future accords? If not, what is the best strategy for the EU to adopt in that situation? So I suppose, again, there's a, a, a little bit of a track record there in terms of yeah. sliding and that type of thing. So how optimistic we could be that any, any, any deal that can be done and if done, uh, would be stuck to. Yeah. The, the question of trust, I think, has has Gone, goes right back actually uh, when it comes to Brexit because you'll remember that when Brexit happened and everybody talked about no return to the borders of the past uh, in the Irish context, the British preference for solving the Irish problem was through a free trade agreement. Theresa May always believed that a future free trade agreement would be so closely, would, would see such close alignment between both sides that there wouldn't need to be any checks and controls on the Irish border. Um, you know, she believed in high alignment when it came to customs and, and uh, goods regulations, even though that was very problematic for her and the Conservative Party. But she initially couldn't understand and her team couldn't understand why the Irish question had to be settled in the divorce. That They felt it was, since it was to do with trade and customs, that was all a future relationship issue. But of course, the EU and Ireland felt instinctively that if they left the Irish border to the future, then it would become a bargaining chip in the negotiations uh, for the UK. So that was why, that, that's how, in a sense, there was a, an immediate lack of trust on the Irish and UK uh, and EU side going into this process, because they simply didn't trust the UK not to try and make it 
a bargaining chip in the future relationship negotiations. Um, so we had the withdrawal agreement concluded in October last year and the Irish protocol is part of that. And we did have a period right up until May when there wasn't really a huge amount of trust on the EU side that the UK was going to fully implement the withdrawal, the Irish protocol, which is part of the withdrawal agreement. Perhaps even that they didn't fully understand what they'd signed up to, what the obligations would be in terms of customs, in terms of VAT and excise, in terms of regulatory alignment uh, in Northern Ireland to, to the rest of the, the EU single market for goods. Uh, and that's because you had you know, clear, unambiguous declarations from people all the way to the top, including Boris Johnson, saying that there would be no checks or controls, no need for paperwork on goods going both ways between Northern Ireland uh, and Great Britain. And also a clear sense that the UK felt that the joint committee, which is there to implement the protocol and other aspects of the withdrawal agreement, um, that that was there really as a forum to negotiate away some of the more unpleasant obligations of the Northern Ireland protocol. So for those reasons, there, there was certainly alarm on the EU side that, that Britain uh, was not fully uh, understanding what its obligations were or was signaling that it wasn't fully going to implement those obligations. And that did cause uh, quite a bit of unease. And I think that's why the initial row over the office in Belfast kind of blew up um, because, you know, in a sense, if the UK is not going to uh, fully implement the checks and controls that are there, then you, you're going to need to have a hand on the shoulder. You're going to need to have close oversight by the European Commission, by member state officials who, who are fully qualified in implementing EU customs and VAT and animal health law and so on. Uh, so I think the lack of trust was definitely there. Um, and also was compounded by the fact that the, the UK seemed to be taking forever to show that it was preparing to implement this new regime at the end of the year, that it was hiring vets, that it was setting up an IT system, uh, and that it was going to start preparing infrastructure because th this it's no use doing this at the end of the transition. It has to be done, you know, the, the process has to start by, by the end of June. Um, so that was compounding the lack of trust, I think. Um, but the... Uh, there are certainly signs that the UK is coming forward now with with more concrete detail on on what is um, what it's doing. Um, but it is important as well to remember that implementing the protocol is an international obligation that the UK has signed up to, and that it can be taken to the European Court of Justice if it doesn't. And people in the UK can take the British government to court if the protocol isn't being implemented. That's all written into the, the treaty that Boris Johnson signed. So while there has been a problem with trust, um, there are safeguards there. Uh, but of course, if you do come to the end of this year and there are yawning gaps in implementation when it comes to the Northern Ireland Protocol, then the question is, what leverage does the uh, EU have? The nuclear option would be to say, well, we can't conclude this free trade agreement until you do X, Y, and Z at the Port of Larne um, or Belfast or Warren Point. Um, I don't think the EU likes to work like that, um, but uh, it, it does raise a question mark over what happens at the end of this year. But certainly there are much more encouraging signs for the EU at least that that the work is now getting underway uh, at a much greater uh, speed. Okay, thank you, Tony. We've got questions, questions here. Maybe just uh, link two of them together. One from Paddy Smith, a colleague, a journalist, of course, the Irish Times. And a second one from Bobby McDonough. And just again, to restate the Chatham House part, that we're in the Chatham House section of this um, engagement at the moment. But uh, Paddy wants to know, does uh, Tony have a sense that um, the, pandemic, the pandemic may be providing cover for Brexiteers who do not want a deal by conceding the inevitable cost of a no deal. And then Bobby uh, McDonough, what is the view in Brussels about who is really calling the shots in London? Is it Johnson, Gove or Cummings? Okay, on, on the pandemic, um, I mean, certainly th there has been um, a belief that you could kind of 
smuggle the pain of a no deal Brexit through under the cover of, of the existing pain of, of the pandemic. Um, I mean, I think, I think that belief is attributed to the, 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 tr the true believers uh, of, of, of the Brexit movement, um, especially the cohort of Vote Leave, uh, people who have found their way inside number 10. Um, there, there was a great um, analogy by Raphael Baer, I think, in The Guardian, who said these true believers like regard a, a hard Brexit as a, as a, a glass of whiskey that is better enjoyed um, as a straight shot down the gullet rather than to be sipped. Um, but I, I don't think that their influence um, has been fully tested yet. Uh, I think in the first half of this year, Boris Johnson was obviously preoccupied by his own illness, by lots of other things. And the feeling here was that he hadn't fully engaged with the negotiating process, but that he is now much more engaged. And I think the fact that um, he agreed in the high-level conference that uh, an agreement isn't going to come out of the sky, both sides have to uh, shift on their positions. I think people here find that encouraging. Um, and of course, the EU has said that they know that they will have to compromise as well, uh, qualifying that by saying, Compromise is not a dirty word in Brussels. It's perhaps the essence of, of the place. Um, and yet they're not going to compromise on their on their principles, uh, the role of the European Court of Justice and so on. Um, so I, I think the, the idea that Britain is going to go freewheeling towards a crash out, uh, no trade deal Brexit at the end of this year has probably receded a bit after the high level conference. Yeah, I do detect that it's in both sides' interest to get a, an agreement. And they do have a, a mechanism now where they can test the margins uh, and the politics of the margins more effectively when they're face-to-face, -face, when they're in smaller teams. Um, I still don't think that they're going to have a, a magic tunnel appearing in July. I think that is all going to happen in September and October. And, um, you know, it's, it's quite likely that the EU has self-interest in that regard. Um, but I think the overall trying to use the pandemic as cover is probably a bit of a fantasy entertained by certain people in number 10, but probably won't bear out in the end. So can you remind me of Bobby's question again? Uh, Bobby, Bobby, what is the view in Brussels about who is really calling the shots in London? Is it Johnson, Gove or Cummings? Well, certainly when Dominic Cummings was appointed as special advisor to Boris Johnson, there was a real sense of deflation here in Brussels among uh, member states, among the working party, uh, which is the group that brings together Brexit coordinators. I mean, I think British observers are always amazed at how closely the, um, the system here in Brussels follows UK politics. I mean, they have followed it obsessively since the referendum and they have to, they have to read uh, what their opponent is made of and the ambient forces around the, the, their opponent. Um, so nobody underestimates the, 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 the influence of Dominic Cummings. I think they see that he was largely responsible for the decision not to extend the transition. And of course, that decision was taken at a time when Boris Johnson was either in hospital or uh, convalescing. Um, so certainly he has been a very important figure up to now. But I think there is a belief now that, that Johnson is going to be more in the driving seat as we get into the autumn. Um, I mean, Johnson is a strange character in terms of his perception in Brussels. He is, in, in some ways, a fairly toxic brand, uh, given his time as Foreign Secretary, some of the things he said about the EU on the record. But also he is perceived as one who will pragmatically uh, you know, turn on a sixpence if it means getting a deal. And that was really the experience in October of last year. And that might, again, come around to haunt Boris Johnson, the fact that he... Uh, what he swallowed last year what was really quite something, given what he'd said on, on the issue previously. Um, so uh, I think as we get into the autumn, the belief here is that Johnson will be more in charge. Michael Gove is kind of more tied up with the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. Um, you know, that keeps him extremely busy because he's constantly being 
you know, harangued by northern business organizations about the slow pace of detail coming out from uh, the system in Whitehall on what changes are going to have to be made. Um, so it's not clear from my vantage point here what influence Gove is going to have on the future relationship, although he is seen as you know, a fairly true blue believer in, in Brexit and you know, uh, uh, something of a zealot uh, when, it, when it comes to the crunch. Um, but I think the feeling now ultimately is that Boris Johnson will assume a more managerial role uh, once we get into the autumn. That's obviously t touch wood, um, presupposing we don't have a, a, a second wave uh, in the pandemic. Yeah, just uh, but with some exceptions, of course, uh, UK journalism it still continues and asserts uh, British exceptionalism, uh, and I suppose constantly uh, obscure the realities of the UK uh, negotiating position. I mean, how how does the Commission uh, view or, or manage the shortcomings in UK media handling of, of issues like Brexit? I mean, it must be very frustrating uh, when they follow uh, uh, media coverage from Brussels obsessively, as you say, to see just the, the level of it, which is so. Uh, uh, it's so uh, at times it's just at times simply unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, I think um, that, you know over the years, even going back to the 1980s, uh, and certainly following the the Maastricht Treaty, um, I think the EU has been aware of the the force of of tabloid antipathy and. Uh, not just tabloid, obviously, broadsheet antipathy to, to the European project as well. And I mean, the, the impression I would get over the past couple of years is that people here, uh, member states, members of the Commission, uh, are fully aware that the, Britain has been in a kind of submerged civil war uh, since the Brexit referendum, and that there is so much signaling that, that has to be done to one constituency or another, and that in the quiet of the negotiating room, the UK will take a more pragmatic uh, position, um, but you know th that tide of opprobrium directed at Europe certainly had results in terms of how people vote uh, in the end, and and you know people are sore over here about that, uh, no doubt. Um, uh, you know it's it's expressed privately, but you know maybe publicly by people like Martin Schulz, uh, former president of the of the Parliament, um, but. You know, especially during Theresa May's reign, there, there, there was a, a real understanding of the pressures that she was under and why she had to uh, direct a certain reassurance to, you know, her party, the European research group in her party, uh, that she was constantly trying to ride several horses at, at the one time. And I think there was a certain amount of slack uh, given to her. But... When it came to the crunch, like in Salzburg in uh, in September of 2019, um, sorry, 2018, uh, you know, when when the EU finally kind of spelled it out to Theresa May, you know, there there were there was a hue and cry from from London that she was humiliated and uh, so on. So you you do get this real disconnect uh, in, in perspectives, um, but overall, I'd say. You know the commission, the member states factor in that th there's there's signalling going on all the time, um, that that might be different to what's happening in in the negotiating room. Okay, thanks. So just a question here from Tobias Locke. He says the UK currently proposes the conclusion of ten different agreements altogether. The EU wants only one for very good reasons. Uh, what do you expect? The, when do you expect the UK to climb down from that tree and accede to the EU's demands? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I, you know, my overall, I would say that the UK is going to have to move further than the EU uh, on, on the big issues. Um, I mean, the EU is still very united and th there's more of a kind of a take it or leave it attitude in the EU. You know, they, they like the single market and the way it functions is extremely important to member states, especially at the moment uh, with the pandemic and the fact that so much money is going into strengthening the single market, um, that they are not going to want to take any risks with it when it comes to the autumn. Um, I think on fisheries, the EU is probably going to have to shift a bit more um, on, on zonal attachment and away from the, the status quo. Um, 
you know, it, okay, there, there may be some areas where, you know, when a push comes to shove in the autumn, that they may agree some separate standalone mm -hmm. uh, governance agreements. But, you know, I think the EU does not want this relationship to be bedeviled by constant friction and constant dispute resolution over time. And I think that's really is what's going to guide the EU's posture in, in the autumn. Thank you, Tony. Just a question here from Jane Olmeyer in Trinity. Uh, thank you for your insights, Tony. Have there been any discussions about the UK's involvement in research, for example, Horizon Europe or the Erasmus Exchange, Erasmus Exchange Programme? Um, yes, I mean, th those, are part, those are sort of ongoing issues in the negotiations. Um, and certainly if the UK wants to access Horizon 2020, it'll have to pay into that particular uh, fund uh, for the privilege. Um, I, just from memory, I can't detect any major um, controversies there, and certainly the EU would want the UK, with its, you know, the excellence of its universities, uh, to keep uh, participating in, in Horizon 2020, or uh, the, the new, whatever the successor is. Um, on, on Erasmus, again, that's something that's open to the UK if they want to pay into it, but uh, there were reports last week that the UK wants to have its own um, international exchange program, which uh, has annoyed quite a few people just from reading some of the reaction to it. But th those are two areas that have not really raised a lot of controversy so far. But um, you know, that, that's something I can maybe come back to in a, at another time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from Lee McDonnell, um, he says the Stormont Assembly had the a chance to debate Brexit for the first time. Uh, when it voted in favour of an extension to the transition period, he says, along with the DUP ready to attack the need for checks at the Irish Sea, how will this affect the post-deal um, political climate, considering Stormont's role in the withdrawal agreement? And he said, the second question, are there any legal manoeuvres that can be made for an extension to occur after July 1, um, an intermediary uh, cooperation agreement, for example? Well, on the second one, I think... All of the experts who've looked at this uh, would agree, or the experts that, to my mind, really matter, people like Jean-Claude Pires, the former Secretary General uh, in the in the Council, um, that, that there, there is no treaty-based way to have uh, an extension to the transition, you know, at, at this stage. The, the, that ship has sailed. Uh, the end of June was the deadline for that, and the UK has clearly said they don't want an extension. Um, so I, I don't see that uh, being an issue. Um, the role of Stormont in overseeing and uh, accepting the Northern Ireland Protocol, I think, is a very grave um, reality that's going to be there in coming years. Uh, and it's, I don't think it gets the, the debate that it deserves. And essentially, there is a, a new consent mechanism in the Irish Protocol, which means that after four years, Stormont can give its view in a simple majority form uh, format of whether or not certain provisions of the protocol, Articles 5 to 10, should continue. Those are the alignment uh, provisions of the protocol. All the other parts of the protocol on North-South cooperation and so on would continue. But they, they could vote to pull out of, of those arrangements. So it's really, it, 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 it puts the Irish government in a slightly difficult situation because the Irish government will inherit any crisis that comes around four years after the protocol takes effect. So the way to avoid a crisis is for the protocol to gain acceptance, to be metabolized by the business community and by people in general. Uh, and so obviously the more burdensome or bureaucratic or costly it becomes, not just for businesses, but also for consumers who might find that they're, for whatever reason, um, there, there is suddenly uh, less of a choice of produce in supermarket shelves because of the workings through of the protocol that they might turn against it as well. And so it's in uh, everybody's interest that the protocol is um, accepted and that it works efficiently. Um, but of course, the government can't go against the grain of what member states want, and they just want to make sure that the protocol works, that the, the Northern Ireland does not become a backdoor into the single market, and that there can be a reasonable uh, accounting for where goods go, uh, whether 
tariffs should be paid, whether parts of goods from Great Britain are processed and then sold on across the border. Um, you know, they want to make sure that, that all of that is done according to the letter of the protocol. And this all has to be worked out, by the way, by uh, the Joint Committee. Um, what, what are the criteria for judging which goods are deemed at risk of crossing the border and which are deemed uh, not at risk and should therefore not attract any tariff? Um, but tariffs are not, there are still going to be checks and controls. There's still going to be, um, you know, quite considerable amount of paperwork. Uh, not just North Great Britain to Northern Ireland, also goods going from Northern Ireland to Great Britain uh, will, according to the EU's Union Customs Code, will have to provide a an exit summary declaration, which is cumbersome and expensive, um, but that's going to be something the EU is going to insist on. Um, so I think th the protocol is going to be difficult and you know, we've got assembly elections coming up soon and, you know, the, the, um, the polarization effect of Brexit doesn't end with the protocol uh, and we're going to be living with this uh, for some time. Really. Uh, just a question from Ted Smith uh, relating again to uh, the Northern Ireland uh, protocol, I presume in particular. He says, Tony, how much influence does support for the Good Friday Agreement by Speaker Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi and uh, Chairman uh, Richie Neal? have on the British government policy on Northern Ireland and its post-Brexit uh, planning? I suppose that's a London question rather than a Brussels question maybe, but nonetheless, I'm sure you're, you're fully capable of addressing it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly, I mean, this is a warning that comes up from time to time and is, is quite a salutary uh, um, declaration from Nancy Pelosi. It's, it's really hard to say something, you know, it's really hard to predict how a threat like that would, um, you know, um, unfold during a, a negotiation. I mean, you would have to ensure that there is a component in the UK-US trade negotiations which specifically shines a light on how the protocol is being implemented by the UK government. Um, I mean, how would you do that in a way that gives all sides clarity as to what's happening? I mean, you're talking about um, the US Congress, which obviously has to approve a trade agreement, are they going to be sufficiently versed in the detail and complexities of the Northern Ireland Protocol to say, you know, we're stopping this train right here until X, Y, and Z happens at the Port of Larn? Um, I mean, you could say that the protocol delivers the promise of no hard border for now. Um, of course, if if Stormont rejects the protocol in years to come and there's no solution found in the two year cooling off period, then we're back to square one. You know, where, where do the checks and controls happen? Um, that, that's the, I suppose that's the Achilles heel of the protocol. Um, but for now, you know, the, 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 the promise of no hard border has been delivered through the protocol. There will not be checks or controls on the border at all. Um, North-South cooperation is protected um, in the same way as protected under Theresa May um, and the initial uh, protocol. The, the rights issue is also factored in to the protocol, although certainly human rights activists have, have reservations about uh, how it will apply. Um, but I, I, I don't see any major red flags there for Congress to, to grab hold of. Um, when it comes to a, a, a free trade agreement with the UK. Um, just a, a, um, a question from Porik Murphy, a um, uh, member of the, the, the Institute, obviously, and a former colleague. He says there are reports, this is in relation to relationships in Brussels, uh, maybe unrelated to Brexit, but nonetheless, uh, there are reports of jockeying for positions between Charles Michel and Ursula von der Leyen uh, in regard uh, to the meeting with Johnson, for example, but not only that, also in relation to Turkey and the rescue packet, package uh, have been mentioned as well. Have you seen any evidence of this, I suppose, friction or tension between the two of them? Um, I, I, I haven't seen that much in, in, in relation to Brexit. Um, I mean, you're, you're always going to get tension between the Commission and the Council anyway. Um, I think Ursula von der Leyen has had a very high profile during the pandemic. She's been extremely active. Um, I think the Commission was really stung by the 
shortfall or the shortcomings of the EU's initial response to the pandemic. Um, when it comes to Brexit, I mean, the, the, the way things operate is that Michel Barnier is the negotiator. He's been given his mandate by member states. And as far as I can see, member states, uh, which is the European Council, uh, in effect, they are content to let Michel Barnier and the Commission handle the negotiations. Um, so I, I haven't detected any major problems. I think there was a, there was there has been a problem with um, a division of labour that Charles Michel set up uh, between his Secretary General and his Sherpa um, over managing um, European summits. And the I think the Sherpa resigned a few weeks ago. But beyond that, I haven't seen any anything that has blown up on the Brexit front between uh, both both uh, institutions. Um, just um, just we're coming to the end now, Tony. We've got about three or four minutes left, and maybe just to focus in, uh, if we could, on the uh, on the German presidency of the of the European Union, which of course begins on the uh, on the first of July. So we've two questions here: one from um, uh, uh, John Cronin in McCann's uh, McCann Fitzgerald, and a second one from uh, Brian Daly of KPMG. Uh, John's question is, what significance will the German presidency of the EU play or have and what role will Angela Merkel uh, play? And from Brian, uh, does Tony see the German presidency having any impact on how the process will move from here? I think it's a very, both very interesting questions and I think it's a bit of a misconception that um, presidents, presidencies have played uh, any major role on the, in the Brexit process. I mean, as far as I can see going back to June 2016, I, I can't see any presidency that has, has, has made a big difference in terms of steering or influencing the, um, the, the, the negotiations on the withdrawal agreement and then the subsequent negotiations on the future relationship. I mean, Croatia is handing over, obviously, to Germany at the moment. I mean, apart from the fact that Salzburg provided a very dramatic setting to a huge row that Theresa May had with um, the EU uh, 27 leaders, you know, you, you can't really point to, you know, a single um, decisive intervention by a presidency. Now, obviously, a German presidency is not just a, your, your ordinary presidency. And of course, there's that added um, flavor of the myth of Angela Merkel or the German car makers coming to Britain's rescue. Um, but, uh, you know, again, Michel Barnier has the mandate from member states and he's entirely supported by Angela Merkel and, and the other leaders. Um, and, you know, if he's going to, if he is going to have his mandate changed, then the German presidency isn't going to dictate that. It'll be something that the EU 27 through the Working Party, through the General Affairs Council, and then up, upwards to the, the leaders uh, at, at a at leader level, they will be the ones who decide to relax or, or change his negotiating mandate. It won't be the German presidency. Um, that being said, of course, Angela Merkel will be an, a, an extremely influ influential individual in, especially in the final stages. I mean, the there was an absolutely decisive phone call between Angela Merkel and Boris Johnson in the middle of October, which changed everything. And that was when she told Boris Johnson that his plan for a customs border on the island of Ireland with uh, te technological facilitations was simply not going to be accepted. And three days later, we had the Thornton Manor encounter with um, the Taoiseach and Boris Johnson. So Angela Merkel's voice certainly carries a lot of weight. Um, but I, to be honest, I don't think the German presidency per se will make a huge amount of difference. Okay, well, on that note, uh, Tony, we're just coming up to two o'clock uh, Dublin time. So uh, we're going to draw, there, there are several other questions that I haven't been able to get to, um, but um, I think you've covered the gist of, of many of them in any event in your presentation and in your Q&A, so we're grateful for that. But again, well, thank you for, for being with us today. Pleasure. Thank you for, for, for giving us the insights on a regular basis as you do from Brussels when I wake up every Saturday morning and your, your dissertation. Um, I know that I'm... <laughs> 
I've had you're, my- you're, you're depressed for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's excellent stuff. And, and I'm sure it's also read by, by uh, very widely indeed, not just here in Ireland, but also Brussels and in London as well. So yeah, thank you very much. Just keep up the good work there. And um, the next six months, again, are uh, critical uh, on so many fronts, but not least of all Brexit. People, I think, you know, uh, that we, we frequently hear in the Institute that people are getting tired of Brexit, that the Brexit issue has been over uh, overexposed in some respects. But in fact, the more you speak about it, the more you, one realises that uh, there are so many issues yet to be resolved and that must be resolved in the interest not just of Ireland, but of the UK and the Union as a whole. Okay. So thank you, Tony, and um, um, enjoy, the rest of the, um, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much well, indeed. Thank you, Michael. Thanks a lot. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.